Good morning. It is a joy to welcome you in this format, and I hope that uh, your Sabbath is going well. I hope that uh, as we are getting into this and we still have a bit to go, that you're finding a good rhythm. I know that I'm having to make some uh, adjustments even a few weeks in and how I'm, I'm working because uh, weird times. But um, it's a joy that we can take this moment to worship, and I invite you to listen to this reading from the book of Genesis. We read in Genesis 3, 1 through 7 and 21 to 24. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. And jumping ahead to the end of the chapter. And then the Lord God made garments of skin for the man and for his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed a cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to, to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks. Be to God. We continue our time in the Easter season. Easter began last Sunday, and it lasts until Pentecost, which is still a month and a half away. During this time, our focus is on living as resurrection people, even more so than any other time of the year. And so we will be taking this Easter season to ask some questions about how the resurrection shapes how we live. I think of these, uh, these weeks as asking Easter questions. What are the questions that come up based upon celebrating Easter? And, and we're gonna, we're gonna make, we are going to begin today by grappling with one of the most obvious questions uh, rooted in Easter. How do we handle second chances? The forgiveness offered by Jesus and the resurrection which follows are fundamentally an offering of a second chance to all of us who choose to accept this offer. We know this and we proclaim this every time that we confess we have fallen short of the glory of God and we hear you are forgiven. That is the giving of a second chance. The, the hearing that just because we have done something that offends God, that does not mean our relationship is cut off. There's, there's always this second chance that is being offered. And we know that as people who receive a second chance in our lives, that uh, we are designed and called to overflow with, with what we are filled with. And so we are called to give our neighbors a second chance as well. We read in, in places like Luke 6, 38, uh, Jesus talks about how our lives are like a cup full of grain pressed down because there's just so much there. And as the grain pours down, it overflows and it's an abundance for all around. Around. And we hear that, and we know that we have been given a second chance, and then it is then incumbent upon us to go and offer second chances to others as well. And wouldn't it be nice if it was just that simple and easy? Right? Wouldn't it be nice to, to just be able to give second chances and not, not be bothered by it? I mean, it, it's... 
it's obvious to say that we struggle with this. Like we hear Jesus tell his disciples uh, that we are to forgive 70 times, seven times, and that seven is the number of completion. And so 70 times seven is not like we have to count up exactly how many times we forgive somebody, but this is the, a complete life of forgiveness, a life of forgiving, a life of offering second chances. That is how we are to live. We see Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And we, we see that and we know that that is, as people who follow in Jesus' footsteps, that is how we are called to live as well, to forgive people. And then we get to that moment where we would actually give someone a second chance and we either don't offer it, because uh, we don't want to, and then we worry about whether we're really Christian. Or we do offer a second chance, and we worry about whether we're going to be taken for a ride again. And that's the crux of the matter. We, no one likes being taken for a ride. No one likes being fooled. No one likes being taken advantage of. And the very nature of it being a second chance is that there was a first chance. I mean, it's kind of in the name. Second, right? For there to be a second, there had to be a first time that it didn't work. There had to be a first time that someone could have told the truth, could have followed through, could have done what's right, and they didn't. And so now, while something is still hurting and broken and messed up because the first time didn't go right, now there's a, this is a second chance, right? Second chances would be a lot easier if they were first chances. But then they wouldn't be second chances. Like the logic of it is just as hard. And even if it's not me personally that was taken advantage of the first time, even if it's just if it was someone I know or something I know about, right? To to offer someone a second chance when when we know it went badly the first time. Well, that's hard. That, that's just not easy. I mean, it's easy to, to, to say we should do, but to actually do it, not, not, not now. And so to, for us to think through what this looks like, as Easter people, people of a second chance, people who then offer uh, second chances to others, how, how do we offer second chances? I think we go back and we look at the first second chance. The first time a second chance was given, to be more precise, right? The first second chance was with Adam and Eve. Right? That, that's it. That's the first time. If you go all the way back to Adam and Eve and boil the story all the way down, they had a choice to, made, to make. They, they did not choose wisely. They whiffed, right? Don't eat from this tree. They ate from this tree. That's it. Like, that was, they, they were trusted to choose wisely. They did not. So what happens? They're given... A second chance. Right? The Father who loves us so much that way down the road, right, we will hear from the, the words of God saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do, right? The same God who eventually will say that those words begins at, at the beginning of Scripture by forgiving and giving Adam and Eve a second chance. Now, what's that second chance look like? Now, just to be blazingly obvious, the second chance doesn't look like the first chance, because it's not the first chance. Something changed, right? A second chance doesn't look like a first chance. In this case, they don't live in the garden. There are going to be changes that happen. And, and we could go through the changes that occur, occur the consequences uh, of their, their actions, that their relationships can be broken, that they will know that work is hard, and that they will have an awareness of pain. Like, we could go through, there will be an enmity with, with uh, snakes, right? And, and so that we can go through all the, the consequences of this. And if you want to know more about it, there's a great book called How Good Do We Have to Be by a Rabbi Kushner that I highly recommend to you if you have some free time to read in. But we're not going to get into that today because it is, suffices just to say that the second chance doesn't look like the first chance. Right? There are consequences. The second chance is shaped by what happened the first time. The second chance doesn't say that nothing happened. The second chance looks at what happened the first time and says, how are we going to do it differently because that just happened? We see further that in how God treats Adam and Eve, that when he sends them out, 
he still has great goodwill towards them. He gives them clothing. Right? I'm, I'm sending you out. You're going to have the second chance, and I'm going to do what I can to help you. I'm going to give you the clothing you need uh, to, to, to make this happen. Right? A second chance is rooted in a genuine desire for it to work better the second time. Not, the second chance is not rooted in, in a just sort of blind hope, thinking, oh yeah, it'll be great, right? Nor is the second chance rooted in a cynical fear that the past is going to be repeated. No, a second chance, we see, takes into account the first event, and then does what it can to make the second time go better. Okay, that's how God handled it with Adam and Eve. What do we do then? Like, how, how do we handle the giving of second chances? As people who follow Jesus, as people whose forgiveness and salvation, future and hope is rooted in second chances, how do we give second chances in a way that lines up with what we see God doing with Adam and Eve? Well, first, I think we need to have the genuine desire for someone to do better the second time. Right? God wants Adam and Eve to do well. He doesn't just write them off and end their relationship. He gives them clothing. He helps them. He does what he can. Yes, there are consequences. Yes, they're going to have to leave the garden. But it's not that God doesn't act out of good will. To give some, someone a second chance begins with genuinely desiring them to do better. And this might be the single hardest part of it. Right, to believe that people can change, to believe that we can give them, that giving them another chance is a good thing, and we're giving them an opportunity, not blindly, but we want them to do better. That can be hard to do when we're still hurting from the first chance. But that's what it takes. That's the start of it. Second, the second part of this, once we genuinely desire the other person to do well, even if we're still hurting, the second part is to evaluate the consequences of what went wrong the first time. Right? Adam and Eve ate from, the, ate from the tree. And so the consequences were they don't get access to the tree. Right? What, what happened the first time such that that needs to be taken into account for the second chance to make sense? Right? What, what happened the first time to make it go off the rails? To love our neighbors doesn't pretend that everything is perfect and always has been and always will be. Right? It is to say to love our neighbors, to offer a second chance, is to take the time to tell the truth about what got broken the first time. And what is usually broken is trust. Right? Trust is broken, and so what went wrong, what trust was broken, let's be sure to name that clearly. And then the third step is to offer a second chance on terms that take into account what went wrong the first time. All right? As I said, Adam and Eve chose to eat from a, they chose to eat from a tree. The concept that that's what that was the decision. That's how it went off the rails. Now they lose access to the tree. That's the consequence. That's what changes now. Right? And so if someone has broken my trust and, and, and they they want I've hired them to do something and, and they don't do it. They broken trust, right? And they want a second chance. There's a big difference between saying I will hire you to mow my lawn versus saying I will hire you to watch my children. Right? There's a big difference with the church saying, I will hire you to do some handiwork around the church versus saying, I want to hire you to do the church's books. Right? And I can't give a specific example because it's always going to be contextual. It will always have to take into account what happened the first time. But we intuitively know this, right? When trust has been broken because the first chance didn't work out, to give someone a second chance is not to pretend that the first one didn't happen. It's to say, we can do something, but it's not going to look the same. And I think it is absolutely essential for everyone involved, the person giving the second chance and the person receiving the second chance, to be clear about this, this aspect of it, right? Because if, if, if someone is insisting on having a first chance for a second time, then they're not being honest with themselves about what went wrong, about what's broken. And a second chance can be offered 
but the person doesn't, I mean, sometimes I've offered a second chance to someone and they haven't accepted it because they haven't accepted it because they haven't wanted to accept the terms. They didn't want to accept that something went off the rails the first time, right? So it's a two-way street here. Right? First, you got to be a, first is to genuinely desire good for the other person. Second is to be able to name what went off the rails. And third is to offer the second chance based upon what happened the first time. And that requires both sides to have clarity and to have an understanding with each other. And if the other person, the other party, doesn't want to accept those terms, you know what, I can offer a chance. It's up to the other person to decide whether to take it or not. That's on them. I gotta tell you that my life has been made possible because I have been given second chances. I've been given second chances by the people I love, by the churches I serve, by the friends who continue to name me as friend, even when I have not been a friend in return to them, right? I am deeply thankful for the second chances I have been given in my life. I am most thankful for the second chance given in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that, that gives me hope, that makes this Easter, Easter season season possible, that, that I can say that I follow Jesus, and because of that, I do have hope in people. I do have hope that people can change. I hope that when I'm giving, given second chances, I can choose to do better, and that by the grace of God, when, when I offer people second chances, they can change, and they can do better. I pray that each of us might continue to, to, to do this, to live as people both who have received a second chance and further be people who then offer second chances. Not blindly, but offer second chances that take into account what happened before so that the second time goes far better. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, we only know you because you gave us a second chance, and you set it up for us long before we knew that we needed it. We have hope in our future because it is, first of all, your future, made possible by your Son, Jesus Christ, who forgave us. We know that to love our neighbors is to pass along this same love, and yet we admit that we don't want to be hurt, we don't want to be made a fool of, we don't want to deal with it sometimes, and so we pray for your help. We pray for your help to be able to choose to love folks. We pray for your help so that we might be as wise as serpents and gentle as doves, so that we might do as you do. Give us a second chance. Give us, having given us a second chance, we pray that we might give others a second chance that both acknowledges the past and creates a way pe for people to have a future, a future with us and following you. We pray for those who are struggling with these times. We pray for those who are struggling to understand. We pray for those struggling to cope, struggling with boredom or depression or being overwhelmed. We pray for a nation that needs to work together and that currently can't seem to agree on much. We pray for our communities, our church, and for our future that is in your hands. Amen. Friends, I hope you are doing well. I look forward to seeing you again soon, hopefully. Peace be with you. Amen.